as has been said, um, Monday passed, the Lord spoke to me, and he wants me to share something with you. Now, now, a lot of people don't understand the principles of the kingdom of God very well, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain a couple things, just so you kind of understand what's going on. We've been talking a little bit uh, in, in the healing school on Saturday nights about things like, in the Old Testament, it says that God made sick. God struck this person. God did this. And this messes Christians up because, because they don't understand a concept. God never hurts someone. God never makes sick. God never causes curse to come to someone's life. That's not, the, that's not what God does. And, uh, and because, because of a lack of understanding, so I'm just going to, I don't have time to expound on it, but I'm just going to tell you, all right? The principle is, uh, is this, that in Hebrew, in Bible language, in, the, in Hebrew especially, um, there is what is called a permissive verb. Now, if you don't know your English very well, you, you won't even know what a verb is. But a verb is in the middle of the sentence. It's the action part, you know. And uh, so the, uh, a permissive verb is giving permission. Okay, so we don't have that in English. We don't have permissive verbs. So when we translate the Bible, we always said, God struck so-and-so with this disease. God did this. God did that. But that's not actually accurate. God didn't do it. Like in the book of Exodus chapter 12, God says, I'm going to strike the firstborn uh, of Israel with, uh, uh, and their firstborn will die with death. And he says he's, he's going to do it. But later on, you read in the same chapter of Exodus chapter 12 that it was the angel of death that did it. Because God gave permission. See, we don't have that in our English language, so we just say God did it, God did it. God never, never puts sickness on people. God never puts curse on people. God never, God's good all the time. He will judge our lives. But the Bible says he's patient, <laughs> long-suffering. He waits a long time. But he will, because he's a just God, he will judge our lives and, and allow, and he will allow sickness and disease to come on our life if we do not judge ourselves. So in other words, I can abort that and judge myself regularly, Right? That's what communion's about. That's what self-reflection is about. That which, that's what repentance is about. So if I live a repentant, humble life before God, I can walk in divine health. I can walk in prosperity. I can walk in all the blessings of God because God does not hurt me in any way. He's for me in every way. And the destroyer won't have access because I'm judging myself. Now, if you don't understand that concept when you read the Bible, it looks at times like God is doing things to his people that are, that are bad. We live in a culture today that thinks God does bad things to the church. Now, the reason you need to understand this, is, and the, the reason God's getting me to explain this, is because of what just happened in the election. All right? And uh, God spoke to me very clearly on Monday morning before the vote, voting results were actually fully in. And, uh, and he said, I want you to tell the church. And, and here's another concept that you may not understand. Some of the national voices in every country of the world and the international voices are not in so-called big places. Right? See, our a lot of carnal Christians' definition of success is big. But that's not, God's, that's not God's definition. God does not define success as big. God defines success as obedient. Right? So when you're obedient to the things of God and you're doing what God asks you to do, it doesn't necessarily look like we don't have, you know, 10,000 people here. We don't have 1,000 people here. But some of the greatest prophetic voices and some of the greatest movers and shakers in the realm of the spirit are in very secluded places. Just so you know that. I am a national voice for this nation. I have been given that position through Victory Churches. I'm on the national board. I'm the prophetic voice for Victory Churches. I'm also an international voice. Yet we're in a very small place. Right? 
But you got to learn how to appreciate that. So when I, when I share this word, it's a national word. And so if you're looking at success as a large bunch of people, God cares a hoot about that. If you read in the Bible about uh, his word getting released, he doesn't care who hears it. Right? God's never concerned about having the crowd there. He, he, what ha has to happen is it has to go into the atmosphere. Principalities and powers and rulers in heavenly high places have to hear it. That's what it's all about. Right? And you're here privileged to be able to hear it too. Glory be to God. So open your heart up. Okay? And remember what a permissive verb is. <laughs> God, we are in, I'm going to tell you, we are in the most exciting time that this nation has ever seen. But if you look at it naturally, you're messed up. You have to be spiritual. You have to understand what the Lord is doing right now. And we're in a place of great victory. I, I said, we're in a place of great victory. And God said to me, tell them that the, that the church of Jesus Christ is not losing. Because carnal Christianity has put all their uh, faith in people. Who, how many know that whoever gets elected, <laughs> if we get a new prime minister, which we didn't, but if we got a new prime minister, right? How many know that doesn't necessarily change the country? The Bible says that the leaders that we receive over our lives are who we deserve and that God has the heart of every leader in his hand and he can turn that leader's heart in whatever direction he wants. So the key to this thing is God, not politics. Now we do our best. We do what we're supposed to do. And, and you know, it's like, it's like we live in the flesh and, and we do things we can do. But, but ultimately, God is on the throne. Say, my God is on the throne. And you have to understand these concepts if you're going to understand anything that I say. <laughs> All right? So, so uh, in Ezekiel chapter 37, if you would turn there. Now, I pray that you have an ear to hear what the Spirit of God says. Every now and again in this church, God drops something into my spirit that is at a national level. And I'm going to release it. And he does that not just with me. He does it with other national prophetic voices all across the land because he wants every region to experience his word in season. So this is a word in season. And this is a word, I, I mean, Monday mornings for us is busy in here. And, uh, you know, I don't even think about messages or anything. And I was standing at that window over there looking out the window when he talked to me Amen. on Monday morning before the election results were in. <clears throat> so in Ezekiel chapter 37, I'm going to use the word of God to illustrate to you this morning what he told me. All right, because I'm a prophetic preacher. In other words, a prophetic preacher takes what the God says and then he sees in the word where it is and applies it through a, a word, whether Old or New Testament, will apply it through a word uh, for the now situation. So that's what I'm going to do. Everybody in Ezekiel chapter 37? Are you excited about God? Do you love Canada? Yeah, don't be discouraged. We're exactly where we need to be. It says in Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 1, The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley. And it was full of bones. Then he caused me to pass by them all around. It, and behold, there were very many in the open valley. And indeed, they were very dry. How many know this is, is a picture of death, basically, in a valley? And the bones had been there a while because they were dispersed. You know, maybe animals had taken a leg and taken it over there. And anyways, the bodies were all scattered and apart. And verse 3, and, it said to, and he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? And I want to say to you, is Canada alive? Yes. Amen. <laughs> now, now, just before I read anymore, who are you? That, that flag came off the Peace Tower. It took us 11 years or something, 12 years. Robbie prophesied the, the, week, the same week that that flag came off, uh, what? November the, November the 17th, some a few years back. But that came directly off the Peace Tower. Now, if you were here Sunday night, 
We prayed all the scriptures that are carved onto the peace tower. It took us an hour to pray everything that God has engraved into our parliament in stone. And 90% of it is in the peace tower. We're on the peace tower. And that actually flew on the pl- That's why it's hanging up there. Not, it's not decor. <laughs> I mean, how many know, you know, uh, but that's an actual flag. And, you know, it's under construction. I don't know in our lifetime if it'll be finished. Yeah. Or in my lifetime. Yeah. Maybe the kids. But that, center that center block's under construction for a long time. So we honor that flag. Because it's not just our Canadian flag that has a prophetic history even in and of itself. It hang on the, hung on the peace tower. God gave us that flag. Hallelujah. Because of who we are. Hallelujah. Took years to get that flag. Praise you, Jesus. You go on this list and you wait for years and years and years. We went on the list when we were in Owen Sound. And that's a long time ago. Praise you, Jesus. But there's a reason it's come now. Hallelujah. Now, where was I? Uh, <clears throat> verse 4. And, it, and, he, and, it, and he, again, he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to these bones, old dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Now, what is the word of the Lord for Canada? Healing to the nations. Started back in the early 1700s when the Americans were coming across the border and they were, they were told by uh, the British to leave them alone because there's an end time plan for that nation. This is it. We're in it. Say, I am healing to the nations. Don't ever doubt it. I said, don't ever say it again. I am healing to the nations. This house is healing to the nations. Your individual life is healing to the nations. This country is healing to the nations. And if you don't understand, the enemy knows that. So what greater way to mess with an identity, right, than be leading LGBTQ people, right? Are you here? Why wouldn't we become the head of abortion? In the world? What, what is that? That's an attack. It is. Say, that's an attack against our identity. Who are we? Say it. Healing. healing to the nations. Right? Say, we're healing to the nations. You've got to keep this in perspective. And, you gotta, and I'm going to bring it into the election, and I'm going to wrap this thing up in a bow, hopefully. But you've got to understand who we are. You've got to understand who you are. I'm healing to the nations. How many people in here travel fairly frequently internationally. Put your hands up. Just in this little room here, and there's some not, that aren't here. We travel a lot internationally. And how many are going to Cuba? Woo! Praise you, Jesus. <clears throat> Say, I'm healing, I am healing. to the nations. Why has Canada received so many nations within its nation? And we're not prejudiced, for the most part, like some of the American states. Why has that happened? Because we're healing to the nations. Say it. Now, if you don't know the the prophetic history of our flag, just look at it there. The nine points of of the maple leaf. We We have a leaf in our flag because the book of Revelation says it's the leaf that brings healing to the nations. Blood of Jesus on both sides. The, the leaf is blood red. Righteousness representing the white in the background. The nine gifts and nine fruits of the spirit are in the leaf. It's a profe- it was put into place by our Canadian Prime Minister Pearson, who was born again. Fought for independence from the UK and was, it was a, it was a, I can remember as a boy, it was a, in my house, it was a, it was a big deal to get our own flag. But it's not just any flag. I remember when the Union Jack and all those things were flown, but that's our flag brought in by a Christian with s- symbolic meaning, we're healing to the nations. <laughs> Say, we're healing to the nations. Now, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, uh, Paul tells Timothy, you know, you've got to fight a good warfare with the prophetic words that have been pronounced over your life. So we've got, got to fight warfare 
prayer, and we got to fight with the prophetic words that God has spoken over our nation. We are healing to the nations. We are not perverts. We are not baby killers. We are healing to the nations. Now, you're going you're gonna to understand more as we go. Um, so, so God says, Ezekiel, look at this stuff that's dry, that's broken apart, that's unanointed, that looks dead. And he says, um, verse 5, Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Surely I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will put sinews on you, and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin, and breathe upon you, and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. Verse 7, so I prophesy. Now, you may not realize how big a deal this is right now, but this is a big deal. He prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise and suddenly a rattling and the bones came together bone to bone. Hallelujah. Doesn't matter how drab, dreary, dark something may look. Prophecy works. When you speak the word that God wants you to speak in the season that you speak, you have no idea what's happening in this place this morning. You do not have any idea what's happening in the heavens this morning when I'm sharing what I'm sharing in this place. Prophecy, the word of the Lord, works. Everybody say, the word of the Lord breaks open. Now go with me to, go to, with me to Ezekiel chapter 1. It says, now it came to pass, right at verse 1, Ezekiel 1, verse 1. Now it came to pass in the 13th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river Chebar, that the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God on the fifth day of the month, which was in the fifth year of King Jehoiakim, King Jehoiakim's captivity. The word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans, which is Babylon, by the river Chabar, and the hand of the Lord was upon him there. So this is how this book begins. The word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel the priest. Everybody say, the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel the priest. He was a priest. You see that? It says, it says he was a priest. Ezekiel was a priest. And the word came to him in the land of Babylon. He had been, it was in the land of Chaldeans, but that's the land of Babylon. He was by the river Shebar, and the hand of the Lord was upon him there. Everything that tries to hold us back or down, everything trying to keep us in captivity at this present time, we're breaking loose of. Say, I'm becoming more free. The spirit of revival is more alive than it's ever been before. I'm talking about our nation. I'm talking about your life, your family, your business. Say, the past will not mess up my future. No longer will family, finances, memories of any kind keep you back. Ezekiel has gone under Babylonian captivity. The Bible, the Bible uh, he was oppressed by Nebuchadnezzar himself, and, it, and history says he was in captivity between four and six years. Most believe he was approximately 30 years old when, uh, when this was taking place. The word Ezekiel means strengthened by the Lord. Everybody say strengthened by the Lord. See, we're not losing, we're winning. I said we're not losing, we're winning. <laughs> this man has a priestly lineage. That means he has... Mission, that means he has purpose. That means he, he knows who he is. He's not an ordinary man, this Ezekiel, but he's dedicated. 
He's committed. He's a dedicated man of God. He loves God. He loves the things of God. He worships. He's a worshiper. Everybody say a worshiper. And even though he's committed, a worshiper, and loves the Lord, he's in captivity. Everybody say he's in captivity. Many of you, when you started your walk with Christ, if you had known some of the things you were going to go through, right? You would have said, no, I quit. Right? I, I look at my life, and I think, man, if I knew I had to go through some of the stuff I, had, I went through, I, would, I wouldn't have started. But it's not like that, is it? What does God do? He shows you the end from the beginning. He gives you the end thing, and you go, whoo! <laughs> but he doesn't tell you the crucible part that you get pounded in on the way. Right? He doesn't tell you what he's gonna that he has to actually make you into that. Right? I w I w I w I w it when I, when I started to serve the Lord, it took me three years. I prayed for three years because I knew my journey was going to be interesting. Because I knew too much. And I said, Lord, I'd just rather know too much by myself. So give me cows. I'll milk the cows. But, you know, God has a way of moving you along. But that doesn't mean that the journey is going to be perfectly, wonderfully nice. <clears throat> Say, even though I am committed, even though I love the Lord, and I'm a worshiper, it doesn't mean. Say, it doesn't mean that everything's going to be perfect. God was not caught surprised by this election. Say, God was not surprised by this election. And you shouldn't be either. Hallelujah. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. Say God's plans for our life in this nation are not messed up. No, not messed up at all. How many believe that? How many believe that we're right on schedule? Right on schedule. Something's going to happen in your heart today that's going to change your world and ministry. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Everything that we go through works for us. You're not going to allow the devil or man or low self-esteem or judgment or labels or bad experience stop your mission. Say, I have a purpose. Say, I'm healing to the nation. Say it out loud. I'm healing to the nations. Ezekiel, he had an understanding of principles and patterns of priesthood. He was a worshiper. God was in the forefront of his life. He was not casual about God. He was committed. And so is God committed. And so is Canada committed to becoming healing to the nations of the world. Everybody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. So it's important to see where Ezekiel was. It's very specific. It's in verse 1 of chapter 1. He's in the place of captivity. It says he was among the captives. Everybody say among, among the, captives. the captives. Those that had been carried away, those that had been stripped of dignity, those that had been humiliated, those that, who are, that had been exposed, revealed. He was among them. And, and see, as Christians, we are among every, we're amongst everything that's going on in this nation. So we don't like it because we're committed, right? Is anybody in here committed? You love the Lord. You pray every day. You read your Bible. You're committed to the nation. Say, I'm healing to the nations. I am healing to the nations. <clears throat> There are certain times we, we go through that we can't say that this situation happened before I was saved. 
This happened after I was saved. You know, you can have financial crisis after you're a Christian. You can have problems after you're saved. You can have family issues after you're saved. Things happen to Christians. You know that? <laughs> the church in Canada was praying. The church of Canada was believing. It was off center a little bit. Things got a little confused. But I'm telling you, we are a people that love the Lord. There are lots of Christians that love Jesus in this country. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Come on, give Jesus praise. Hallelujah. There's some people uh, that, that think, what have we done wrong? There's something missing in our walk with the Lord. There's something off, or why has this happened? Leaders are put in place by God. Leaders are put in place by God when he looks at the heart of the church. He doesn't look at the nation. He looks at the heart of the church. When he looks at the heart of the church, they receive what they're supposed to receive over them. If you don't understand spiritual authority, listen to Thursday nights. You, you have to understand that who we have over us is exactly what we need. I am really tired of hearing Christian leaders in my spheres of influence, complain. It's got to shift. Say, it's got to shift. And we're going to talk about that shift. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Has anybody in here raised children the right way and they're not serving God? All right? You stood in faith with your tithe, but you're not getting financially blessed. You prayed, yet stuff still happened. It doesn't make sense. Others did so much less than I did, yet it appears I'm suffering more. All those kinds of phrases. I could say hundreds of those phrases. It's got to stop. Say, it's got to stop. I am blessed of the Lord. I am healing to the nations. Hallelujah. Praise you. It doesn't rise and fall on our prime minister. It rises and falls on God. It rises and falls on how we see ourselves before God. Hallelujah. I'm going to pronounce something. The past is no longer holding you. You're coming out now. The season of exile is over. I said the season of exile is over. Now give him, give him a very strong praise. If you have an ear to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying, give him a very strong praise. Go with me to Psalm 137. Psalm 137. Verse 1 to 4. By the rivers of Babylon, there they, there they sat down, yea, they wept. When we remembered Zion, they, they wept when they remembered Zion. Key. We hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it, for there were those who carried us away captive, asked of us a song. It was mocking. I said it was mocking, ridiculing. Sing a song. Come on, sing a song now. Sing a song now. Where's the church now after the election? Where's their power? Didn't they pray? What's wrong? Everybody say, captive by Babylon. You know that Babylon is the spirit in the book of Revelation that kept the whole world is controlled by Babylon, right? Right? Canada is going to shake free of Babylon and bring healing to the nations. Say, we're being shaken free. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. So... And those who plundered us requested myrrh, saying, sing us one of those songs. I talked to you before about what the spirit of Babylon wants. The spirit of Babylon wants entertainment in the church. Use the songs that are supposed to be spiritual, that stir the hearts of my people to walk further into the kingdom, and use them to entertain with lights and smoke. Babylon is taking what is spiritual and making it into entertainment. That's, that's the whole principle behind Babylon. 
But God is raising up a remnant revolutionary bunch of revivalists that won't stay still to be entertained. We need the we need the real meal deal. We need the presence of the living God active in our lives on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, right through the week. We want the power of God moving. The river of Chabar, in verse 1, represents an ongoing flow. I'm captive and I don't know how long. I don't see the end. God didn't give me a date on how long we have to be subject to liberalism. God didn't give us a day. Say, God didn't give me a day. How many know God hasn't shifted? How many know God's the same as he's always been? Right? God knows exactly what he's doing. And he knows exactly what he's doing in us. Say, I have to become someone. And in order for transformation to change, sometimes we have to get mad enough. In order for transformation on the inside of us to be made into Christ's image, we have to rise up and stop just looking at the surface and become healing to the nations. We have to rise up and say, I wasn't made for this. This is not why I exist. That's not why this nation's here. Is somebody righteously moved by what's going on around you? It's not to kill you. It's not to put you down. It's not to make you into something and conform you into worldly, humanistic things. It's to cause the church to be what God says it is. This church in Canada is not a church like you've ever seen before. The church in Canada is to bring healing to the nations of all the world. Somebody give praise to the Lord. Many are saying, it's beyond my ability to see the end. It's beyond my human ability to fix. I don't know how to network well enough to get this to change. I don't have enough education and charisma and net worth to be influencing to see a change comes. The only way it's going to happen in this hour, listen to me carefully, is we got to stop complaining and start proclaiming. Yeah. Say, i got to stop complaining. And I gotta start proclaiming. If you know Christians that want to talk about the problem and complain about who's over us when we just voted the guy in, <laughs> say, say, I have to shift, and God is shifting me. There is a place that we that we are going to, where God is taking the church from priesthood. To profit. It's not like you're losing your priesthood. How many know in the New Testament we are priests and prophets and kings unto the Lord? And you're worshiping God. And you're dedicated to God. And you're living for God. And you're coming to church. This church has three services a week. You're coming to church. You're, you're opening your Bible. You pray on a daily basis. You are righteous. You are committed people. You are wonderful priests. But the priest has to transition to profit. If the dry bones are going to come together, if God's going to put together this nation, the priests have to turn to profit and begin to speak the word of the Lord in season. And you don't even have to figure out what that word is. I am healing to the nations. I am healing to the nations. I am healing to the nations. Yes, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. When's the last time you woke up in the night and you didn't complain or think about what was wrong, but stood up and say, I'm healing to the nations. This nation's bringing healing to the nations. It doesn't matter how dry and disconnected it looks. It doesn't matter how the body of Christ looks in this nation, whether it looks like it's alive or not. It doesn't matter. God needs somebody that uses their priesthood, loves their commitment and worship level, but says, I got to be more than just a priest. I got to be a prophet in these last days. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. 
Somebody that won't speak continuously about what's wrong, but will speak continuously about destiny. Hallelujah. In order to come, become uh, or move from being a priest to being a prophet requires transformation. It, can, it, it requires continuous input from the Lord. It, it requires being renewed in the way you think, in the way you act, and it is a process. Say it is a process. I believe that when Ezekiel went into Babylonian captivity, he couldn't initially understand it. There are righteous in this country. There are people that are still believing in the glory that we've seen in Zion. There are people that are standing in faith to see the move of God like we know it to be. But the enemy comes to fragment our past so we don't remember the things that God has done. But if we will start to remember what the Spirit of the Lord has done in the past, and remember is, is again put together, put member, remember, remember, remember what God has done. When you begin to remember what God has done, something happens in heaven. Say, I have to remember what the Lord has done for me. How wonderful your salvation was. <laughs> How wonderful your family is. We're changing garments right now as the church in this country for those who will. Will we allow ourselves to move in the garment of the prophet? Why do you think next year's 2020? Everything's coinciding. Second Chronicles 2020, what does it say? Believe in the Lord and you're established. Chronicles 2020. Next year's 2020. I'm prophesying to next year. I'm prophesying to right now. If you believe in the word, you get established. But if you believe in the prophets, you prosper. When God speaks prophetically, if you believe it, you begin to prosper. God spoke prophetically to this house. It's a breakthrough year. If you've been walking around your house and in your business life and family life saying, it's my breakthrough year. It's my breakthrough year. This is my breakthrough year. See, see you will not express the truth if you don't believe the truth. Whose report shall you believe? I'm going to believe the report of the Lord. If we believe the report of the circumstances, the situations, and the symptoms of life, then we will not believe the report of the Lord. So when the report of the Lord comes, it won't change our countenance. How do you know you're a believing something? It changes the way you are. Why are you so joyful about the nation? Why are you so happy that, the, that Canada it, 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 when it is because it's healing? Because I'm, I'm a part of the healing that's going to bring healing to the nations of the world. I'm excited about what the Lord is doing. But as long as you're downcast and forlorn over physical circumstances and natural situations, you're not believing. Say, I must believe. Now, I'm not saying do nothing. Because a believer does everything they can. But I know, without a shadow of a doubt, the transformation from priesthood to prophet is coming out of this land. How do you think nations are going to be touched from Canada? One of the primary ways is we're going to speak. We're going to proclaim. We're going to decree. We're going to declare. And it's going to touch nations. And nations are going to have salvations and revivals and movings of the Spirit of God because of us. Somebody's got to say it. Quit saying the obvious. I, I tell it to people in our church. Well, pastor, you know, we don't do this very good. I go, well, because you see it, that means you're the answer. Pastor, the toilets are dirty. Well, then clean them. It's not my job. I'm the mouthpiece here. 
You're not. Hallelujah. You see something wrong, you're the one who's to fix it. That's why you see it. You don't stand back and say, oh, look at all the things, the shortfall that's in the church, all the things that are wrong. Well, because there's so, there must be something really wrong. They're small. There's a time of influence. Listen to me carefully. There's a time for influence, John the Baptist. Preaching to cacti on the backside of the desert, a lot of people today would say, there must be something wrong with what he's saying. He's the only one screaming out there <laughs> for years. But there was a time. And I said the convergence of the time for this nation and this house, which coincide, by the way, together, the time is coming quickly. And God wants us to be prepared and transition and transform from just not being a committed, on fire, alive worshiper, but being the prophet in your house, being the prophet in your business, proclaiming and decreeing what's true instead of allowing the circumstances and the pressures of life to get you to conform to the spirit of Babylon. Babylon says what it sees. No. I get, I get frustrated when I'm at home with my wife. <laughs> but she sets me free, right? <clears throat> There's songs coming out now. You know, catchy, it's good stuff. <sighs> that says stuff like, because the stars worship and the sun worships, I'm going to worship too. Totally upside down, backwards, and unbelief. Say, I'm the, I am the redeemed of the Lord. And the stars worship because I'm here. Yeah, right now, you've got to get yourself right. If you worship because you see a star, you're whacked. The king of glory birthed you. You're a son of Jesus himself. I don't worship God because I see the sky. I worship God whether there is a sky or there isn't a sky. If a nuclear... Holocaust take place. I worship God. I don't need to be motivated by natural things because I have a supernatural God. Little irritated. Just a little irritated. Good music, good stuff, but ugh, why is that line there? We are the transformed ones. Now, I don't... I, I don't I'm not, you got to understand, this is not prideful. No, it's not. This is true. And when you speak, you got to stand up for what's true. Say, I'm healing to the nation. And the devil's doing everything to kill our identity. And putting, on, putting us on the cusp of the cutting edge in the world. We support projects internationally as a country that'll make you puke. Why? Such a small country like Canada is becoming so profound on the international stage in perversion. Because the devil knows who we are better than we know who we are. Say, I'm healing to the nations. And if we ever get hold of who we are and it ever begins to flow, a, a, an international soul winning revival a, a, a giant move of the power of God is going to swipe this world and Jesus will come back. How many want Jesus to come back? Harvest first, Jesus will be back. How's the harvest going to happen? You. Say transformed lives. And it begins through remembering. Psalm 63, you okay for 10 more minutes? Psalm 63, quick. My soul waits silently, verse 5. My soul, or, sorry, I'm in the wrong, uh, verse 6 in 63. When I remember you on my bed, or when I'm down, or when I'm in lack, or when I don't have enough, I meditate on you in the night, watches, because you have been my help. Therefore, in the shadow 
of your wings, I will rejoice. Say, Canada is in the shadow of the Lord's wings. Say, I'm in the shadow of the Lord's wings. It's not dark as you presume. Say, it's not dark like I think it's dark. I have to begin to remember the Lord. It says when he was down, the psalmist says, I began to remember the good things of God. I began to remember the power of God. I began to remember what the Lord has done. You know, when I went into ministry uh, 30 years ago next year, um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm brand off the farm. I'm a dairy farmer. Uh, a pastor's in, having a revival in Brantford. He, he sends his associate, Linda Bowden, to come and get me. And they come into my farmhouse, and she sits down, and she says, we're experiencing a revival. We went from, you know, 150 people to 450 people on a weekend. We need you to come. I said, hmm, I haven't read the Bible yet, fully. <laughs> and I don't know, have a clue to what I, I love Jesus. And we're seeing lots of moves of the Spirit of God. And anyway, I said, okay. <laughs> didn't know any better, so I went in there. And, and in the first couple of weeks I was there, I didn't know anybody. Nobody. Went to a men's conference. There was 58 men at this men's conference. Everybody say, we got one coming. We got one coming. 58 men, and, 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 and a guy comes up to the front of the altar. I didn't even know who he was. Uh, he, he ended up being a, a leader in the church, and he came up, and he confessed his sins. Both, both his daughters had got pregnant. One was 16, one was 17. They got pregnant out of wedlock, and he, he came to the altar, and he said, it's my fault. Confessed to sin. See, we don't, we don't understand how everything's connected. He knew his heart was wrong, and he was into some stuff that caused that to happen. Comes to the altar, and he's from Cliff, who's in the second row there, uh, to me away. He starts to come. He's confessing out loud as he's walking. The power of God hit that guy. He flew to where Glenn is at the back of the room. And he hit the wall in the midair. He fell to the ground. When he hit the ground, 57 other men fell off of their chairs. When they got off the ground, they all spoke in other tongues. <laughs> Only two or three of them were filled with the Holy Ghost, but when they all got up off of that floor, the whole room at one time, I remember that. If you don't have any memories and you got saved just recently or, or something and you don't have memories like that, get in the Bible and remember what the Bible says. God says if you begin to remember, say when remembering comes, something opens. Say something is opening in this country. Now watch. Say, I'm going through a process. In Ezekiel chapter 1, if you go back there. I want you to see what it says. I want you to read it. He's in captivity amongst the captives. He's captive because everybody's captive. He's a good man. He's, he's a worshiper. He's a priest. And it says, I was among the captives by the, this ongoing flow of this demonic river. And that the heavens were open and I saw visions of God. Now, not from God. Of God. He did not see visions from God. He saw visions of God. Where did he see the visions of God? In captivity. Under the pressure. Under the liberalism. Under the, the identity crisis. Under all these things. He saw visions of God. Everybody say, I'm about to see visions of God. Not from God, not visions God gives you. 
Visions of God himself. An enlargement. An enlargement of who God is. Uh, God is way bigger than this stuff that I'm in. God is way bigger than what's going through this country. God is way bigger than the oppression that natural leaders are putting on the country. Why do you think, why do you think the Messiah was born under taxation? Under a Roman Empire that was oppressive because something great always comes forth when darkness and pressure is upon a people. They begin to see God in a brand new light. And God manifested himself over 2,000 years ago in the birth of his son under taxation and pressure. Under the greatest time of, of demonic influence and pressure under the Roman Empire that had ever existed before on the earth. The people of God thought it was hopeless. The people of God thought it can't change. What can ever, and, and, and they had no vote. But the vote doesn't really matter. Now make sure you vote. How, uh, how many know democracy is not the best? You understand that? Theocracy is the best. God speaks to his people. And they follow. That's the will of the Lord. Democracy <laughs> isn't so great because the majority in this country have walked away from God. So the majority doesn't win. Say the majority <laughs> in this country don't want God. Is that right? So don't expect the political system to be the answer. The majority in this country do not want God right now. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that the minority has no power. The Bible says one with the Lord is a majority. The key is one with the Lord is a majority. <clears throat> so when the church turns to putting all their efforts and prayers into people, I get concerned. Say it's the Lord that has the power. Under the pressure, the priest, Ezekiel, begins to remember. As he remembers, the Bible says, he begins to see God bigger. He begins to see God like this preacher's preaching. That God's way bigger than a political election. God's way bigger than anything that anyone can say about this nation's identity. God's way bigger because he determined hundreds of years ago that healing would come to the nations from this nation and he can turn and do what he needs to do. But we got to stop complaining and start proclaiming. It says, and I'm winding up, it says that Ezekiel began to remember and then it says, it, it's, he began to see God, visions of God, not from God. The dimension and the size of God, the bigness of God. That he was more than just a savior, he was a healer. That he was more than just a healer, he was a deliverer. That he was more than just glory, but he was the lifter of my head. He was more than just the prince of peace, he was wonderful counselor. He was bigger and 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 bigger. And as he saw him bigger and bigger, he realized that he was in a temporary season. He was in a temporary season. And that which was being transformed was him. He was becoming someone that he wasn't before because he saw God bigger. Can we see God bigger in this house? Can we see God bigger in this nation? God's way bigger than what you just experienced this week. God is so big. He is so powerful. And all he needs is for us to seek him. He'll hear from heaven. Because we repent and seek him, he hears from heaven. He turns and heals the land. He heals the land. He heals the land. He heals the land. Praise Praise Hallelujah. 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 Praise you, Lord. The Bible says that as... He saw visions of God. It says in verse 2, it gives us dates and everything of the captivity. Then verse 3, a word of the Lord came. When you see God bigger, you hear God broader. When you see God bigger, you begin to hear God in dimensions and ways you've never heard him before. 
I'm telling you, we're coming into 2020, the year of vision, the year of seeing Jesus bigger, the year of seeing the Holy Ghost bigger, the year of seeing God bigger. And you're going to hear God like you've never heard him before because faith comes by hearing, not seeing. Seeing and expansion comes through vision of God. But once you have vision from God, God has to bring a word to you so that you can hear something so you have the faith to be able to move into something. Glory to God. Hallelujah. It says he, it says that Ezekiel, once he saw an expanded version of God, the word of the Lord came to him expressly to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzzi in the land of the Babylonians, by the river Shepar. And, the, and because he was able to hear the Lord in this expanded way, it said that the hand of the Lord came upon him. He began to experience the presence of God in his life like he'd never experienced the presence of God. Where? Amongst the captives. Where? Under a liberal spirit. Under everything that is against what you believe. Babylon was against everything that priest believed. But he began to see God like he'd never seen God before. Then he began to hear God like he never heard God before. And then he began being touched by God. He said, what is happening? I'm experiencing my God in such a dark place. I am being transformed. And seven times in the book, The hand of the Lord comes upon him until the day that we find in Ezekiel 37 that he is now fully dressed in the prophet's role. And God said, I have brought you through transformation, my priest. And now you're the prophet that you're going to speak to the nation that is dry and disconnected. And there'll be anointing and authority and power in your voice because you will declare and decree my word. Yes, they will live. Say I say that they will live. Prophesy the destiny of the land instead of complaining about the things that are going on around you. When he prophesied, in a transformative state to his land. An army began to arrive. Don't go by what you see. Go by what you hear. Ezekiel developed an ear to hear God because he kept seeing God bigger than what he was in. And God would come to him and talk to him and put his hand on him. And seven times he would experience the presence of God in this book. And the hand of the Lord would be upon him until the day came where God says, now look at how dry and disconnected and dysfunctional and ineffective this nation is. Can it live? He says, I don't know. Only you know, Lord. Smart, smart guy. Because he needed a word. God said, they will surely live. He goes, good. They will surely live. But if he hadn't had developed his ear, through seeing God bigger, enlarging his vision of who God is. Today, my prayer is that God's way bigger than what just happened. You got to remember who he is. I remember the God that touched that men's room. Not asked for or believed for, just did it. In that little room with those few men, I saw something. I saw a largeness I'd never seen. And I'm telling you, since then, I've seen him do great and powerful things. And God is large, but we have no idea how large he is. And we got to remember what he's done. And we got to thank him for what he's done. And and the times people have been touched and healed and begin to remember. And that's why we give so much testimony in this church. Because you got to remember what the Lord is doing. And when you remember what the Lord is doing, God gets bigger in your sight. And then you begin to hear him. And pretty soon you're experiencing him. And something rises up in you and says, it looks totally dead, but Canada's coming alive. And God said to me on Monday morning, tell them, tell the nation, tell people, tell whoever is in your sphere of influence, tell them. It's not up to me, it's up to you. Stop complaining about what is wrong. 
and start proclaiming what is right. Start putting on Facebook, healing of, we're healing of the, to the nations. People will laugh at you, they'll mock at you, they'll ridicule you, they'll not understand. Carnal Christianity under Babylonian spirit will think you're not. But you're seeing it. Say, I'm seeing God. God said we're healing to the nations. I don't have to figure out how he's going to do it. He's big enough. I'm going to hear him when he speaks to me. And I'm going to experience him, him and I'm going to prophesy. Grandmas are going to prophesy in their house. When you look at national revivals of the past, I like the Welsh revival. Three little old ladies, one of them blind. In a mow of a barn. Start prophesying. They start declaring, declaring, Wales is saved. Wales is saved. They were speaking the word of the Lord. And then people were plowing fields and working businesses and in their homes. And they'd leave their homes and they'd walk down to police stations because the conviction was so high, the whole nation got saved. Because three little old ladies in the mow of a barn saw God bigger. It doesn't take a crowd. It takes somebody seeing God bigger. And God says that in this little country that I've reserved for the last days, in this nation of Canada that's newer than any other country basically in the world and has all kinds of nations within it, I have reserved a plan. And if they will see me bigger and if they will see what I can do, I will speak to them and they will arise and they will prophesy to their land and they will speak to the things of their flag into the nation and they will declare and they will declare decree that I am bringing healing to the nations through them and when they see themselves in the identity that I've given them every false identity will lose its voice every falsehood will lose the only reason the only reason there are false identities coming up is because the voice of Canada has been lost it's been attacked. Shh. It's not politically correct. You just talked about the Liberal Party. Shh. That's intimidation. That's called witchcraft. Anybody that tells you if you do something, something's going to happen, they're a prog- pro- what do you call that? Prognosticator. They are declaring through witchcraft what's going to happen. You step out, you're going to go to jail. You're a prognosticator. Shut up. That's the spirit of Jezebel itself. Nobody can determine the outcome of my life or what happens to me other than my God. And if he sees fit to have me go to jail, there's a purpose. Just like there was the Apostle Paul in the Bible to go see Caesar. There's purpose for everything. And I want to serve the Lord. And I want to be what he wants me to be. Don't come under the spirit of prognostication that declares what's going to happen tomorrow based on what's happening today. That's witchcraft. Your past, the past of this country, cannot determine what's going to happen in the future in this country. What determines the future of this country are the people that declare the truth into this country and declare to the principalities, the powers and hosts of wickedness in heavenly high places. You don't have the influence you think because the church of righteousness is rising up and moving from priesthood to prophet. So you better get scared. We're driving you out of this place. Stand, stand to your feet. Think we said enough? Um, Ezekiel was not to, asked to prophesy right away. He was not asked to prophesy when he got there under captivity. He had to envision a bigger God under captivity. He had to hear God under captivity. He had to be transformed under captivity until he was so big on the inside because of what he was seeing in God and what God was doing by touching his life in a pressure-packed place he he grew himself to the size that he could now say to the nation behold our destiny is not coming from the systems of the world the systems that are in this country our destiny is going to be fulfilled by you. Say, I am here to bring the destiny of Canada into play through my 
proclamation, conf my confession, my decrees. Not just because I know to. Because I want to. I've become so big, enlarged, that I have to say something. And I don't care if it's politically correct, and I don't care about jail, and I don't care about what they might do, and I don't care about their threatenings and all that stuff that goes on in media. I don't care, and God will protect us because this destiny must come. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego under that system said, we hear what you say, Neb, and if you throw us into the fire... We got a God we still love. And you know the end of the story. The fire didn't touch them. They didn't even come out smelling like smoke. But the ones that threw them in were no more. We're in that day. I said Canada, we're in that day. BVC, we're in that day. Hallelujah. So let yourself see God bigger. Open your ears to hear what he has to say. Let him touch your life in the midst of what's going on in our nation. And say every day, I am healing to the nations. I am healing to the nations. You may put me down. It may look bad. But it isn't worse than Ezekiel 37. I don't know if you could get worse. It may be disconnected in this country, the body of Christ. It may be barren. And, and anoint, no, no anointing in it. But I'm telling you, there's a group that are rising up to see what it is and will hear the Lord and put it back together. Churches all over this region are going to experience revival. The mega church system is going to collapse and they're all going to get born again, filled with the Holy Ghost. And the presence of God is going to be amongst the thousands that gather to be entertained by Babylon, they're going to begin to be worshipers of God. And, it's going to, and they're going to, we're going to stand together and we're going to praise the Lord. And we're going to give him glory that our nation's destiny is coming to pass. We are not in a worse place. We are not in an, oh, I don't know how long this has to last. Well, I'm telling you, it's not going to change with a man. It's going to change with God. And it's going to change when his people see God the way he is. And hear him and act on it and proclaim. So let's lift our hands to the Lord. You've been very patient. If you've been listening online, you need Jesus in your life. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus personally, you don't have him in your heart, get, get saved. You've got to have him in your heart. Going to church doesn't get you to heaven. Having Jesus on the inside gets you into heaven. If you're here and you've never accepted Jesus, everybody put your hands down. I want to be able to see. If you're here and you've never accepted Jesus, just put your hands up and wave. Nobody? You're all Okay. Because I don't want any of you to go somewhere tomorrow if something happens. You gotta, you know, every person on earth lives forever in one of two places. You make the choice. And if you're here, you get the choice today. Hallelujah. And I tell you, the underground choice, hell forever isn't the greatest thing. You're all by yourself, tormented forever with all your problems and addictions and all the things that you went to hell with amplified. You don't want that place. Never made for human beings. It was made for demons. God keeps having to expand it. It wasn't in his plan. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Say, I want to go to heaven. Praise God. So everybody's good? Filled with the Holy Ghost on fire for God, praying in other tongues? Living full out? Wanting to see God bigger every day? Let's pray. Put your own hand on your own head. Lord, I want to see an enlarged version of you in this country. Lord, I'm, I'm ready to enlarge. I want you to expand my vision of who you are. I'm open to have an ear to hear you on new dimensions as I see you in a bigger way. Touch me experientially so that I'm not just living by faith, but Lord, I'm living in your presence. I believe I receive it, Lord. I will be a end time declarative person. I will speak the vision and destiny of this country to every person that says in the contrary. 
To everybody that complains, I will proclaim. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, that's going to be challenged. I've been talking to lots of pastors this week. Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Especially Westerners. Our Western pastors, they think we're idiots over here. Because we voted in the liberals. They were all blue. It's not about that. Shut up. Shut up. Proclaim the destiny of Canada. Proclaim the destiny of Canada. Proclaim the destiny of Canada. That's what the transformation is. That's why the pressure stays on. Because we have to be transformed under the pressure. So we rise up and be what we're supposed to be to defeat the darkness. In Jesus' name. Well, have a wonderful afternoon. Great lunch. Give somebody a hug. Hope to see you Thursday night. Dr. George and Hazel will be here Thursday and Saturday. Come out. You'll be blessed.